The parable of the prodigal son comes in Luke. Uh, in the beginning of Luke, Jesus is beginning to have conversations with people of the town. Uh, the Pharisee and scribes are beginning to put a little bit of pressure to him. He's feeling the wrenches and the pliers of what they're saying. Uh, it is one of 46 parables in the Bible. What father in their right mind would say to their kid, here's one third of your inheritance? I wouldn't. There's a reason why his father gives it to him. Because the illustration is this, it shows us the reflection of the amazing indulgence that God shows towards us. You wanna know why? Because even when we are sitting directly against him, he allows us to fail and to fail miserably. Look at the indulgence that God even grants us once we've made a profession of faith. Unbelievable to think that he's so long suffering towards us. So there's a reflection of exactly what the father represents in letting this kid have his indulgence. Now, this is what I find interesting. Five particular things, maybe six particular things about the father. Number one, he sees the boy coming home from afar. Two things with that. Number one, does it mean he was looking for him? Yeah, man, it was this kid. Now, I don't know when my boy's coming home from college, but if he calls me up, and says, yeah, I'll be home. I start looking at my watch about the time I think he needs to be home. I want to look from a near to when his car pulls in the driveway. I'm not looking for him on 96. Yeah. The father, it says, was looking for him from afar. Now, I find that to be really nice because I know a God that has written my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and has seen me from afar. How far? Before the very foundation of the world, he knew my name would be written in that Lamb's Book of Life. How about this one right here? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew your name from afar. Man, that's catastrophic. That's eternally catastrophic. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have God say to me, depart from me, you work. But Lord, we did all these great things in your name. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew your name. I was never intimate with your name. I was never writing your name in the Lamb's Book of Life from afar. Number two, he runs to the boy. Isn't it God's upside down economy that God would run to us? That he's out there chasing us? Pastor Clark used, likes to use the word, the hound of heaven is, is chasing us, right? Once he gets on your side, he's chasing us. Because the scripture is very plain when it says, no one seeketh after God. So now we have the upside down economy of a Jewish father who's in robes running to his prodigal son. Not a very distinguished look for a Jewish father. Number three, he hugs and kisses his son all over in celebration. I still hug and kiss my kids hello and goodbye. Doesn't matter, they're my kids. They'll be my kids forever. They're the third greatest gift that God's ever given me, my wife being number one. And I love to hug and kiss her hello and goodbye. She's mine. God gave her to me, and I'm with her. And my kids, God gave those kids to me. And God gave me to them. I'm going to hug and kiss them every chance I get because there will be a day when there's no more of that. This is what blows my mind. He doesn't admonish the boy with I told you so's. There's no interrogation, no denigration, no investigation. When my kids go to the mailbox, I say, where are you going? <laughs> Who are you going with? How long are you going to be gone? What are you going to do out there? Dad, I'm just going to the mailbox. It's right over there. But the father doesn't do that, does he? When we come to our loving father's arm, does he say, okay, <laughs> Kyle. Now, where were, you back in, where were you back in 85, Kyle? Okay, he, he doesn't do any of that at all. He accepts us with an open arm because the sin debt has been paid in full. Do you really think God needs to ask a rhetorical question like, hey, where you been? He knows where we've been. That's why his son went to the cross, because he knows where we've been, and he knows what we're doing, he knows what we're thinking, and he knows where we're going. That's the crazy part. So where's the money I gave you, by the way? Uh, do you have an Excel spreadsheet with the details and receipts? Yeah, doesn't do any of that. Nor does our Heavenly Father say that to us. He puts a robe on him. Are we not robed in the righteousness of Christ? He puts a ring on him to signify royalty and an acceptance and a replacement back into the family. 
Do we not have the ring of Christ? Because we're, what more, we're children of the king. That means we're royalty. We can never be removed from that. God is our heavenly father, which means we're a child of the king. And if he gave his only begotten son, what more can he give to us but eternal life and love and acceptance unconditionally? This is the best part. He put sandals on the boy. Now the Pharisees would know what this means. The sandals represent he was no longer a slave by having no sandals on his feet. He's a taken person. And we're having the sandals that Christ, because we're accepted into the family of Christ from the very foundation of the world. Our sandals, our robe, and our rings are all there telling the world we have a heavenly father. We have a double imputation. My unrighteousness gets cast onto Christ. His righteousness gets put onto me. That's the robe of righteousness. My feet are covered by the sandals of, of the shed blood of Christ. I'm off the slave market of sin. And now I'm a bond servant. I'm a bond slave to Christ. Think about the kid. Think about his lostness. Think about what the father does in accepting him back. He's running. He's indistinguished. He's breaking these rules. He's kissing his kid. He's making sure that everybody knows, hey, this is my boy. My boy has come home. My boy. Not you. I don't care about your boy. My boy has come home. And that's what he's saying. He orders a celebration. My son was once dead. Now he's alive again. There isn't a parent here who wouldn't love to proclaim that my son is alive again. He was lost, and now he's alive. My boy has come home. My lineage, my love, my everything has come home in my boy, my namesake, my genetics, my past, my future. He has come home. He's come home to a welcoming father with open arms, just like we can come home to the open arms of Christ and our Father. J.C. Rye once said, One single soul saved shall outlive and outweigh all the kingdoms of this modern world. So now let's turn to the fatted calf. Not usually people talk about the fatted calf in this story, but it's actually the best part of the story. There is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And what does he do? He takes not just the calf, he takes the fatted calf, the prized calf. God doesn't just use any bull and goat. He takes his only son and sheds his blood for the remission of our sins. That is the fatted calf in the story. It is Christ and him crucified. A celebration of a sinner coming home to the Lord. God did not spare his only son for the remission of our sins. We are the sinner, that is me. We are saved, that is through Jesus. The sacrifice was Calvary and the celebration is eternal security. All in one line that says, kill the fatted calf, the prize calf. It wasn't that he had a choice of how many calves. There was one calf. It wasn't like God said, well, let's get him. No, no, no. He had one son. It wasn't like he could pick one. Uh, I don't know. One. I love my boy, man. I love my daughter. I don't know if I want to give up my daughter. I don't want to know if I want to give up my son. It's tough. One, he had to give it up.